Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Welcome to The Cost of the Status Quo. Today, we're here with Marielle Kraft, a lovely human being who can be found singing, songwriting, playing guitar, educating, and making us all melt with the way that she curates everything from her social media presence to her live shows. Marielle is from Rhode Island, like myself. Shout out to Rhode Island. Marielle, who has shared the stage with incredible musicians like John McLaughlin, Ava Max, and Betty Who. Today, Marielle is here to share a bit about her story and the tips, tricks, and habits she's learned along the way. Listeners, thank you for listening. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed this. Welcome, Ariel. Thanks so much for making the time to be here. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Heck yeah. So let's go all the way, all the way back because we have to. Context is super important. What was it like growing up here in this tiny little state? Little Rhodey. It was awesome. I like it more now that I don't live there, unfortunately. Um, I feel like that always happens though. People grow up in a place and you don't fully appreciate it for what it is until you leave. And growing up there, I loved it. I was super involved in high school, made some good friends, but I didn't really take advantage of the like scenery in Rhode Island as much as I did when I was a tourist coming back home, visiting through college and post-grad, but I loved it. I had a good community um, and I still have friends who I see when I go back. It's crazy because I didn't know you when we lived there together, but now <laughs> we, we were both Rhode Islanders um, in the smallest state of all time. You would think we would have known each other if we were involved in the same things, but but uh, but yeah, it's a great community. Amazing. And then where are you calling in from today? I now live in Nashville. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half and I love it. It's the best. I made trips down here when I was living in Delaware post-grad and which is crazy. We also lived in Delaware and then I see you here in Nashville. <laughs> like what? It, stop following me. <laughs> or maybe I'm following you actually. I feel like I've lived in these places see? after you. Oh, there it's on go. me. My bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I... I made trips down here and it just felt like it was a whole town of people like me and I'd never felt that before. So I've been really enjoying being here full time and building my own community of friends and collaborators. And I feel like it's just propelled me faster than any other place I've been. So it's been really good. That's the best. So you're obviously into music now. We'll touch on that later in terms of what you've what you've been cooking up, which is super exciting. But have you always been into music have you always been playing guitar? Have you always been singing? Or where did when did that come into the picture? I think that I've always been singing for fun. My earliest memory of singing is in my elementary school talent show. I was in third grade. I was eight. I, at the time, I was living in um, Lutherville in Maryland, right outside of Towson. And I auditioned for the talent show in third grade with the song, My Favorite Things from The Sound of Music the iconic yes. tune. And uh and I didn't really know how to play anything at the time, but I learned how to play like bum 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 ba dum just like the melody with one finger on the piano, but I couldn't sing and play at the same time because I was 8. So I played the melody of the chorus and then I stood up and I said raindrops on roses and then just did it separately. <laughs> like I did like a completely disjointed performance. And I think it was endearing so they let me perform in the talent show. But yeah, that was my earliest memory of public performance. And then it was just like singing for fun. Like I did some drama club shows growing up and then I got a guitar and started learning how to play it in high school just for like learning how to cover T-Swift songs, trying to be her. And then in college, I was just doing it for fun as well because I went to school to become an educator. So I became a sixth grade English teacher, post-grad full-time in the classroom so still, it was just like a fun outlet, just something I could do. And I would play bar gigs when I was teaching. And that kind of really planted the seed for me to want to do more with it because I was consistently playing and getting better and using it as an outlet as I was going through my first real adulthood experiences. And then from there, I feel like it just sort of naturally happened. Like the doors opened kind of on their own and I just decided to step through them and s see where they took me. You know something about that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and it's brought me here. So <laughs> what was the catalyst that got you into education? 
I always wanted to be a teacher from like the time I entered kindergarten. My mom was a teacher too. So I think it was just the whole wanting to be like my mom kind of thing. And then my favorite experiences in the world happened at school. That's where I found my friends. That's where I like did drama club and sports and like all of these things that like made my life rich was through school. And my teachers were like my favorite people. So I always wanted to be that. And then I I did do that. I really went on and did it for one year. And uh, <laughs> and then I was like, skirt. <laughs> <laughs> was there an expectation <laughs> from your mom or from your family that you were going to be an educator, a teacher in that capacity or they just supported you? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was definitely my mom saying, how fun would it be if we both were teachers? You know, it wasn't like (laughs) you must be a teacher, but it was definitely this hopeful kind of encouragement of you'd be a great teacher. Maybe think more about that. And I was like, you're right. You know, um, it never was something that I felt forced into at all. But looking back, I do think that most conversations were about me growing up to become a teacher. So it just, yeah, it happened that way. Interesting. Okay. And so you're in the classroom, you said for a year and then on the side playing these bar gigs. What was that jumping off point? Was it a calculated jump off the cliff? Was it a financial decision? Like what were those things (laughs) that were going on consciously, subconsciously that made it so you could take that jump from being a full-time teacher into being a musician? Oh, man. If I were, I mean, I'm 27 now and I was 23 when I made that leap. If I were 27 considering it, I don't think I would have done it. I'm going to be totally honest with you. (laughs) So it was definitely a good thing that I was young and more naive than I am now. I, I knew that I would have to do it on my own. My family made that abundantly clear, not because they didn't want to support me, but because my parents were like the tough love kind of thing where, you know, if you're going to do something, you're going to scrape your way through and figure it out. And you'll be more proud of that once you do, which was really hard to hear at the time, but I'm so grateful they did that. So I left teaching at the end of the school year in June of 2018. And basically like, I was like, well, (laughs) let's just hope and pray that these occasional cover gigs for a couple hundred dollars will be enough for rent. I don't think I knew how much budgeting really worked at the time. I was like, I need this much for rent per month and like a couple hundred after that, which is not realistic in the slightest. Rent should be a quarter of, if if not less of your income. At the time I was like, oh, rent is most of my income and well, I can eat otherwise, you know? Thankfully, we are not here to get financial advice from you. No, and I will not be providing any at this time. But, But that definitely was the kind of like spontaneous... I mean, it was a calculated spontaneity, but I think I just ripped the Band-Aid and was like, let's see what happens. Um, So I left and I moved from the D.C. area. (laughs) I I was living in like the D.C. area, which was obviously more pricey than moving back to Wilmington, Delaware. So I moved back to Wilmington, found roommates who brought the rent way down and then just did cover gigs full time for two years until everything shut down. And because I was, you know, more consistent with it and able to just do it full time, I fell into a routine of like making enough. I definitely found after a few months, I was like, okay, I can do this. But the first few were precarious, but I had savings, so it was fine. But yeah, I mean, the confidence I had from my agent who had picked me up that year of teaching, he was like, we can do this. And I just blindly trusted him. Thank goodness I did because it panned out. But I really, I really gave Ben a lot of trust in that time. (laughs) (laughs) At some point in the near future, we will also have Marielle's agent, Ben. You should. Yes. On this podcast. So you're doing mostly covers at this point, bopping around Wilmington, greater DC area, Philly, presumably wandering about. And so what, what were those gigs like and what, <laughs> oh, gosh. what were the feelings like at that huh. time between, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be doing cover gigs forever, but unfortunately that is what pays the bills in yes. a lot of music industry culture as of now. What, what was that balance like? Well, it was it was the balance of 80% of my work was cover gigs and very demoralizing. And I'm the girl in the corner just getting beer thrown on her and asking if I can play Wagon Wheel again. And then the other 20% was me writing songs that I really cared about, about like deep, vulnerable moments in my life, and then getting to play them once a month at an opening slot at a show, at a real venue. So 
it was definitely a time of building a lot of character and definitely like a lot of humbling experiences that have made me so grateful that I that I cut my teeth in that way. It built so much stamina for me because when you show up and you play four three-hour gigs in a weekend and it's just you and your guitar, I mean, you really got to have the stamina in your voice and in like your repertoire and being able to read the room. I I think between sixth grade middle school teaching and playing bar gigs in Dewey Beach, Delaware, I can read a, any room you put me in, man. <laughs> I could I could figure it out. Um, the emotional intelligence yes. off the charts. So that has honestly really helped me in my touring career now um, with real shows because I can step into a room and I'm opening for this band right now that most of their demographic is like our parents' age and older. And my songs are not written for the 60-somethings of America. They can be. They sure are. They can be consumed by them, but <laughs> they, they're not as relatable to that demographic. So walking into the room, I'm like, okay, these are the songs that I'm playing because they're the songs I've put out. But how do I transform these stories to be relatable for them leading into each song to still bring them in? And I can do that on the spot because of these gigs that I had to play and get the tips and change my set. If there's a bachelorette party, I'm playing Katy Perry. You know, if there's like guys coming in from golf, I'm going to be playing Tom Petty. It's just like totally was something I had to learn on the fly. And it's really helped in my career more than I expected. Because at the time I was like, I'm wasting my time. This is just a, a fast check. This isn't making me any better. But really, it honestly so did. And so I tried to keep that mentality of like, I do this because I have to so that I can do the things that I want to. You know, I collect the checks so that I can go to the studio and then put out the songs and then get on people's radar and then tour and then sell the merch and then do this full time. I like saw it. I saw it ahead of me. But some days you just show up and you don't. You don't want to do it, but you do. But it was good. I mean, ultimately, it was really fun and better than being my own boss is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So I, I was so grateful for that. Was there ever any intentional integration of your knowledge from being an educator, from being a teacher, being in the classroom that intentionally or otherwise bled into your music career? Absolutely. I feel like every musician should have an education degree. I really feel that. I feel like one, it was definitely my adaptability in travel and performing. When you walk into a classroom and a student is having a mental breakdown, you have to be able to change all of your plans in a moment's notice to be able to impact every single different learner in the room and also support this one child who is fully weeping in the corner. So it's like, how do you do all of that while also hitting your standards in the curriculum? Great question. Teachers should be paid a million dollars. But I, I definitely learned like, you know, when you show up to sound check and the sound guy isn't there, how do you problem solve and be the person that still makes things happen when everything is going wrong? Also with lesson planning, you know, being able to think forward of the checkpoints you have to hit and the different like pieces of organization that have to be in order for me to be able to run a full unit. Like that is so how I operate with my booking, with my itineraries, with like my expenses. All of that is because of my lesson planning like routine that I had when I was teaching. And I feel like I'm able to be like 10 steps ahead in the planning process for a release because of how I had to be 10 steps ahead in in my lessons. You know, I was like, if one student says this, then I'll be able to do this. And now it's like, if this song doesn't hit, I'll be able to do this, you know? So it definitely translates in all the ways I know that I'm a bit of an anomaly in that way. Like I'll walk into band practice with my band and have like a whiteboard of like, here are the things you did well. Here are the things we can work on together. And I've literally walked in with a whiteboard and they're like, how about you just step back for a minute and let us be musicians? <laughs> but no, ultimately, like everything's a pretty well-oiled machine because of that, even though it comes off pretty intensely to other people. <laughs> hey, some whatever it is that you're doing, it's clearly working. I'm a fan. I support it. So... Along with that, because this is always something that I've I've been curious of as as a fan, as an outsider, as somebody who's watched your career grow over the last few years, when you're planning out, are you planning out a week at a time, a month at a time, a year at a time, five years at a time? What does that vision look like to you from a big picture perspective? And then what is that process for you of dialing it back to that smallest executable step? Mm, that's a good question. I feel like each aspect of my career has a different projection of time. So for touring, for example, Ben and I have to be able to plan up to a year ahead. 
But some of those plans, it's it's the balance of how many of those shows are going to be concrete and how many of those are going to be like flexible potential opportunities. And how do we plan for each of those? So if we know that an artist we're really trying to open for is going on tour in February of 2023, I'm not going to plan my own tour in February of 2023. But in the event that that opening slot doesn't come through for that run for that artist, I need to be able to have things to fall back on, like a corporate event here or a wedding there that are big paychecks that still hit my bills. So it's that that song and dance of a lot of potentials you have to be able to change everything on a moment's notice. But if you don't have things that are definitely set in stone, you're going to be left out to dry. So booking is usually, you know, between six to 16 months out, six to 18 months. Releases are between, you know, three to 12 months out. For me with having an EP right now, it's a full project of six songs. So I had to know what the EP release date was going to be before I released my first single, because now I have to space them out in today's industry. You kind of have to be really consistent when you're releasing music between, you know, whether that's four songs between each release, six songs, whatever it is, it has to be consistent for like algorithmic purposes. And so with it being six songs and I knew four, I was going to release ahead of time. That means that it's, it's a five to six month cycle where it's, five weeks between each track. And then the last two come out as the full project in September. And so like, I've known that since February, that that was going to be my schedule, even though only two songs were done in February. I was like, okay, this is when they're coming out. So we got to finish this right now. But in terms of like songwriting sessions, that can happen, you know, a couple of weeks before everyone's schedule is really busy, especially here in Nashville. So some people, if you're touring like me, I know that I'm not scheduling anything in August because I'm gone the whole month. So I might put you in September. But if I have an opening next week, we might just throw a session on the calendar. So it just, everything is a different timetable. Um, But I love the balance of being both a planner and being able to be adaptable no matter if anything happens. Like that balance works for me. Totally. No, well, one, I appreciate you lifting the curtain in some ways around the mysterious inner workings of the music industry. I think that that's <laughs> helpful for anyone who's listening, sure. <laughs> who's interested in being involved in, in the industry, whether it's on the production side of things or being an artist themselves. And then two, thank you for dispelling everything about artists being quote unquote poor and starving. To me, anyway, is the perfect example of somebody who has been able to shape shift and morph and be able to execute well. And on top of it, I think most importantly, consistently, it's it's got to be you. So respect for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. It definitely wasn't an accident. All of this has been very intentional. Um, but yeah, I I definitely love to plan, but this industry doesn't really thrive on people who are very type A. It definitely doesn't. Creatives don't typically also hold a lot of type A qualities. I do feel like an anomaly in that way. Sometimes I come, sometimes I I have, you know, too much for people, but other times I am the glue that holds others together in terms of planning. And I, I'm grateful for that role. I'll take it any day. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think that's something that, that I've definitely experienced too along the way in terms of being involved in a lot of creative projects. It's like, you're either the mom or you're just like you said, you're the glue that's keeping everything together, that's keeping the train running and making sure you know the wheels don't fall off. 100%. Like you mentioned earlier, over the last couple of years or so, you've migrated, sadly, but it's okay, <laughs> migrated over to Nashville. And so what has that experience been like for you? Because it seems as though it's like every time that you get a little bit of comfort, nope, scrap it. Next, <laughs> scrap it. <laughs> so yeah. what is that? What has that process been like for you? I, I, you can also relate to this piece, but I haven't lived in the same place for more than twelve months in a decade. <laughs> I mean, literally. <laughs> so being here now for, I mean, I'm going on a year and a half. It is wild to be able to start to lay down some roots and not feel like I'm packing up again. I really love it here. It's strange because when I lived on the East Coast, because all those cities are really close together and that's where I started to build my audience with shows, I was able to leave, you know, every weekend for like a string of shows to go like, you know, Boston, New York, Philly, DC, or whatever it may be, and then come back home on Tuesday. 
And that is not the case here because I'm quite far from those close cities in the East Coast. When I leave, I leave for a much longer stretch. But that also means that I get to be here for a longer stretch at a time. So I used to be in Delaware for like three days at a time that I would leave and then come back four days later. But now I'm here for like two months, then I'll leave for a month. And so that being here for longer stretches of time has allowed me to really dive into relationships more than I was able to in Delaware, which, you know, selfishly for me has been really awesome outside of my scope of my career because a community really does like make us who we are as people. And I've found that more here than I have in years, really since college, probably when we lived in the same places with our friends. So that's been really good creatively and personally, but it is harder to be away from home for six to 10 weeks at a time. I mean, that is that is much more of an adjustment for me, not being able to like replenish my merch or like do my laundry or be in my bed for a night. That has been a total adjustment, but I love it here. The fact that there are people, I feel like when I live in a place like Delaware, where it's that big fish, small pond mentality of a small pool of creators, you find the people that are going to invest in you because you have to invest in each other. You're all each other has, but if you have a photographer that's good but not amazing, you still have to work with that person because that's the only option that you have. But being here, you have a whole pool of creatives that you can work with. You know, if one videographer is not your cup of tea, you find somebody else because there's a million of us here. So that has been such a blessing. Sometimes it's daunting when you have so many choices, but here I've been able to like involve so many people and make my projects better because of that, which I've really loved. Totally. Oh, that's so good. And so would you say that being able to build and to find that community has led to more and or different levels of success? I think that I've gotten way better in 18 months of being here as specifically as a writer, actually, because this whole town is made of songwriters and I'm with, you know, different writers five times a week in different songwriting sessions. Some of them are really great at melody. Some of them are really great at lyric. Some of them are production. You know, it just depends what it is. So I've been finding my best fit of a role in those rooms. Like really, what is my strong suit? I used to songwrite all my things alone because there were no co-writers I really felt pushed me in Delaware. I didn't really find a lot. I didn't no, I meant, I mean, I didn't seek a lot. I meant to say I didn't seek out many co-writers because I was like, I didn't find much in Delaware either. <laughs> no, no, I swear. Like there are incredibly talented people there, but in terms of pop singer songwriters or who are 20 something women, not a whole lot, not a whole <laughs> slim lot. Slim pickings. To, yeah, slim pickings. But being here, there are people who do this full-time even more than I am who are not even artists. So they're literally in two to, you know, two sessions a day, every day of their life. So they are so fast and so like just trained to be making every song better for the artist. Um, and it's made me better because I'm like, oh, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have thought of that. And then being in the studio with a producer, I was my first studio experience consistently was at a studio in Philly named Retro City. They were amazing for me because they let me come in for like 12 hours a day and work through ideas with them and sit down and be like, let's try this. Let's try this. Does that work? I don't know because I didn't know anything. And being here, time is so precious because everybody is strapped for time and resources because we're all trying to do everything at the same time. So when you get one studio day for a song of six hours for an entire song, I'm like, okay, I have to come in with a vision. I have to come in with ideas worked out. I have to trust that this get that producer, whiteboard. Literally, I have to trust that this producer will be able to deliver on time and have ideas that he created or she created that are going to benefit my song. It's, you know, it's a total test in trusting other creators that, to be great. And it's totally panned out. I mean, it's made me so much better to let other people have creative control with me. I don't know. It's, you know me. I love to be type A and have my hands on every piece going on. <laughs> but it's been a really good practice in letting go a little bit and it's become everything's better now because of that. Can't wait to hear all these new projects that are coming out. Dude, it's going to be super they're exciting. They're awesome. I got to be real. <laughs> I'm really proud. <laughs> this is my best stuff. And every artist is like, this is the best thing I've ever created because they want you to listen. I genuinely will put it to my grave that this is the best thing I've this ever done it. until the okay. next project. But this one for sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, when Mariel Craft comes to your city, you best be there. Absolutely. So we've talked, obviously, a lot about career professional tips and tricks. In your personal life, what have the expectations been? 
How have they been laid out for you? And how, if at all, have you gone against the grain in that regard? Mm, That's a good question. I think that I didn't know that people who are not Taylor Swift famous can make a living doing this. I really didn't know. But the only reason that I can is because I am disciplined and I've learned that on the job. Nobody's going to tell you that. I used to, especially in Delaware, when I was doing cover gigs full time because I knew my income was coming from that. It was it was a really awesome safety net for getting started. But also it wasn't as motivating as I would have liked it to be because I wasn't scraping for rent, which I'm glad. I'm glad I wasn't. But I used to, you know, sleep until whenever. And then if I wrote a song that day, cool. I thought that songwriting had to be like when inspiration strikes. And I think full-time creators have definitely learned this, that yes, there's going to be a piece of inspiration that is in everything that you do, but just like learning how to play guitar, learning how to drive a car. I mean, any of these things you have to practice to be better at it. You can be naturally good at guitar, but if you're not putting in the time to learn your scales, to learn your chords, to learn everything, you're not going to be great. And so that has been something I've really learned in terms of being a creative in my personal life is if I don't have a session that day, that doesn't mean I can chill. That means that I need to practice my set for my next tour. That means I need to try to journal and write something or have ideas from next week. Um, and, and that practice has really shaped me to be better personally and also professionally. But I think too, like I grew up in a family that was really encouraging independence, which I'm so grateful for. But at the same time, I didn't know how to be independent in a career nobody had shown me before. I knew what independence looked like to be in corporate America like my dad. I knew what independence looked like to be a teacher like my mom or to be a you know business person or whatever like my aunts and uncles. But nobody had shown me how to be my own boss. And that, <laughs> that especially with like taxes and like expenses and figuring out like what that means for like 1099ing my band. What is that? Who? Um, I really had to learn so much of that on the job. And I wish that I had people in my life who had done it previous to help me with that. And I think I heard, I heard a lot of what's your backup plan? What's your plan B when this doesn't pan out? As any crazy person does when they leave their full-time job to do something crazy. But that actually never scared me. I never was like, well, I don't worry. I'm going to go get my MBA and I'm just going to be this per like I I never actually felt like nobody thought I could do it. I just think they were trying to protect me in a very cautious way and I was like I believe in myself enough for everyone. And I think you have to be the person that believes in yourself the most or you quite literally will not make it. Period. No, no doubt. Yeah. Or were there any ways that you subconsciously or consciously were able to mitigate the fear of others. I think that's something that comes up often, especially like you just said, it was like, you know, you come home from the holiday for the holidays and everyone's sitting around the the kitchen table or they're in the living room and they're like, Oh, what are you up to? What did you, what do you do? And then it becomes this like, just uh, like nauseating, like (laughs) time to respond where you're like, I'm a something. I'm, I'm I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm doing something. I'm not. I think right. it's working. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Especially to go from being a teacher and, mm-hmm. and people know what that is and they have an idea and they have a vision and they trust that because that yes. historically has been a quote unquote stable career that society has said thumbs up to. So to go home and say, I'm a uh, creative, I'm a musician. What was that process like for you? That I really struggled with not having big things to share at each family function and feeling like I wasn't progressing because I didn't have a bigger tour this time that I was announcing, or I didn't have more streams that I could show them tangibly as tangible success. I knew myself that I was getting better and progressing, but it was so many like intangible ways that I was doing that, that it was impossible to prove that I was really doing it. Um, If I wasn't doubling my income, then I wasn't successful, you know, in the eyes of other people. And that is such a hard line to draw because it's, you feel like you're constantly having to prove your worth that you already know for a fact in yourself, but you don't know how to explain it to somebody else who can't conceptualize that. It's really difficult to be able to do that. And I think I've been able to prove it just by continuing to do it. 
Honestly, like (laughs) just the mere fact that I'm still here (laughs) has hopefully proven to other people that I'm that it's working. (laughs) I haven't asked anyone for a dollar and that has proven to them that I can pay my rent. I haven't, you know, had to move to a place that I can, you know, I haven't. Well, I moved home during the pandemic because everyone did. But I I could have stayed and paid rent without gigs with savings and stuff, but why? When the opportunity is presented to yourself, come on. I'm going to not count that as not success because the whole world shut down. 100%. I really tried to challenge myself in stepping away from the super tangible factual growth. When people ask me, how's it going? All right, I'm trying to say soft answers such as like, I'm writing the best songs I've written, or I'm really proud of the tour that I'm going to announce soon, or like, I'm really excited that somebody new, new found my music in Nebraska. You know, things that are small to me and small to other people, but are also major in the scope of my career. So trying to reframe what success means to myself, hopefully by example, does that for other people who are not in this career path. Oh, I love that so much. But it's been a challenge. It's not been easy. And it's really hard to try to feel like you have to prove that your career is real at every turn. It's like, I promise you, I'm really doing it. <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. And I think that's that's something that we're going to explore a lot, specifically on the show, is really diving into that. Is what does success mean to you? What does success mean to society at large? What does that success mean globally? And how do you dig into that? And what does it mean, especially now in this semi post pandemic world that we're in with younger and younger folks entering the workforce and and things are changing so dramatically how can we redefine it and how can you make it more acceptable to go and do the things that you're doing and not get looked at sideways <laughs> for sure and honestly in this creator economy that we're seeing with gen z rising up now with influencers being a literal career choice for them i feel like that's actually helped creatives who are running their own business because we have all of these jobs popping up that nobody like really goes to school for anymore. And that's allowed me to be able to have more validation in my career too, because I didn't go to school for this, but you you can make it work in any way, especially with the internet now, which is a blessing and a curse. So recently I saw one of your posts on Instagram about one of your new releases called I Kissed a Boy. And along with that, was a pretty lengthy post, which I read all of them because I'm biased, because I'm a fan. But it seemed as though the tone of that post was was a bit different and a bit more vulnerable. Is there anything that you'd like to elaborate on from that? Yeah. Thank you for reading it and noticing. Um, <laughs> I was terrified clicking post on that. Yeah. It's, it's weird because that was the first song that I use she pronouns in, in terms of like a love interest for me, which has been a part of who I am and my identity and my story since college. I mean, it's been years and years and years for me. So it's old news personally. And for all my friends and family, old news. But for people who don't know me personally, which is a majority of my following online, unless they picked up the context clues, which I think anybody in the queer community, it's blatant. But for those who may not know, um, I just wanted to be clear that, hey, I am a part of the queer community and this is a part of my story and I am still who I am. I'm still Marielle. It doesn't change the artist that you love, Um, but I don't want you to ignore this about me, even though I've ignored this about me in my music for a long time. To my listeners who didn't know that side of me, I don't want that to change anything about our relationship, but I know that for some it will. And I think I was so afraid of losing anybody who could potentially support me for so long. But now it's more important to me to bring in those who feel marginalized too into my story and say, I am you. I see you. I This story we can share. If you feel this way, same. That's more important to me to give those people a voice and a comfort than people who are against my community. You know, I would I would rather them gracefully exit my career if they can't support me fully than to continue to quiet a part of myself that doesn't feel quiet in my personal life. And not that I want to be defined by it in any way, 
but I also don't want it to be forgotten. You know, it is it is really important and it is something that we constantly have to fight for our own rights and our own ability to be seen as the same level of artistry, the same caliber of, you know, talent, the same validation in our relationships. We think about it every time we exit the house. So why should I have to make excuses for that, for the comfort of other people who should not be having a say in who I love and, you know, so that was a a come to Jesus moment I had in the last year, especially living in Nashville, where it feels like the queer community here has to be so intentional in binding together in the Northeast, you know, growing up there and going to school up there. It's kind of like, okay, you do you and it is what it is. And you can tell people or not, but like no one cares as much. But being here in a pretty divided South, like I feel like I have to be louder, which was, was a, is uncomfortable for me because it's always just been like a subtle, like I'm a brunette and also I date a woman, you know, but it's so much more important now to be really intentional in my message and who I am and how I present because of, for lack of a better term, the homophobia here. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And I of course, thanks for asking. Understand and empathize with your discomfort around it. It's definitely, it's definitely something that, like you said, you always have to think about when you're leaving the house. And it's unfortunate that that is part of the status quo that exists. Yeah. <laughs> where hundred percent, it's you know, you can. There's nothing to think about when you are cis and white and out in the world. You really don't have to think about navigating any of that, but especially to your point, when you're in a place like Nashville, that is more of that like blue dot and like a red mass and navigating that can be incredibly difficult. So I'm just grateful that you found that, that community and thanks. Yeah. I've been able to, been able to expand in that way and open up and to your, to your larger bigger picture point, I think it is really important that if and when people do have the platforms, we're having these conversations and sharing it because I think that's the only way that we'll be able to continue to grow. I definitely agree with you. And like even recently now with I Kissed a Boy being out, I have to play it live. And that was a huge, that was honestly a bigger, I know that was a bigger (laughs) deal for me than just releasing the song on Spotify. When I'm in a room opening for a band where their demographic is 60 something white people in rural America. And I am on that stage that they bought a ticket to see. They didn't buy a ticket to see me. They bought a ticket to see the people who think like them. And me walking on that stage, which I'm so grateful that the band gave me the platform because they know who I am. You know, it's like, do I make the choice to make I Kissed a Boy really the message of what it is and say that on stage? Or do I try to water down the story so that it's palatable for all people so that they come to my merch table and buy merch. Because I know that some people will not want to support me after hearing that song. But there might be two queer people in the audience who are like shaken to their core <laughs> when there's a queer person <laughs> on the stage talking about their story in a yes. in a red state. You know, like that is going to change that life so much more than the 60 something who can go home and be like, ah, whatever, I'll never listen to her again. You know, and so like that's that's a, a business decision and also a personal decision I have to make every time I get on the stage of I will walk away probably with less money when I say this, but I will probably walk away with a, f- a few people who will support me for life. And that investment to me means more. So it's been weird, but it's been it's been a really good internal monologue um, and conversation that I want to be sure that I'm intentional about. Change when I cross that line. I kissed a boy and I hated it. Yeah, I waited for the spark, it didn't start. So I stayed in it, trying to argue with my heart. Thought I'd feel it if I did it more. Yeah, I wish I wouldn't moan before I kissed a boy. That was so good. <laughs> that was good. That hit right there. Oh, right there. So as we wrap up, what is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And then to end it on a high note, 
what is the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? Yeah, the the worst and best piece of advice that I got is nothing matters. And let me let me tell you why. <laughs> so it's obviously the worst piece of advice because everything matters. <laughs> like everything you do could change the path of your career. Every relationship you make, every interaction you have after a show or in a bar or at a networking event could quite literally change the direction of your career. And also when you put things into your art, that's going to stick with you, especially in the internet day and age. If you tweet something, that's going to come back and find you. If you put a lyric in a song you're not proud of, that's going to come back and find you. So every, every, everything matters. So that's the worst piece of advice that I've ever gotten is nothing matters. But because it's the best piece of advice too, it has presented so much freedom for me in not being so precious with what I do at the same time. It's it's very much a dichotomy, but at the same time that everything matters, if you're so precious about every single post that you put up or every single thing you say on stage, it has to be perfect and curated and so on the money, you are never going to be who you are. It's just impossible for a human to be that calculated. And so, you know, especially in the age of TikTok, I know we weren't going to talk about TikTok today, but here we are. We're bringing it up. It's part of the industry. (laughs) (laughs) I have a love hate, but, but the love piece of TikTok is that it's really taught me that if I have a stupid six second reaction video of the coffee that I drank today and I'm just going to throw it up with no, you know, no meaningful caption and no real intention to do anything, all of those tiny moments add to, add so much to the picture of my authenticity because nothing matters. Just put it up. Literally people's attention span online is that of a goldfish. Throw it up. It's not going to matter. So that has really given me this liberation of like, just do it. Put out the song that you love right now because in 10 years, you're going to have 50 more or 100 more. And this one song, if nobody listens to it right now, it honestly will not matter in the trajectory of your career. And I think I get so caught up in every decision has to be calculated and perfect because it all matters because it does. But honestly, nothing matters. And just do what you love and it's going to fulfill you now and in the long run. So that is my best and worst piece of advice. Nothing matters. I love it. And you literally have a mic that you could drop if you wanted to, which is magical. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, thank you so much for being here today and sharing literally all of your tips and tricks and habits and, you know, the background secrets to all the success that you've had and all the success that is definitely to come. Yeah, man, of course. Thank you so much for doing this podcast and giving a voice to those who have broken the status quo. This is a really cool platform and I'm honored to be a guest. So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.